John Oriel, President of the Petaluma Museum. It's uh, my honor to have you all here today. Of course, when we embarked on this exhibit uh, for the museum, we knew it was going to be an amazing experience, and to be able to have the opportunity to host a Smithsonian exhibition is really a pinnacle for our organization. And uh, you know, when we start putting together a speaker series, that's when the fun starts. You know, who can we bring in here to kind of enhance this exhibition? And we really hit a home run today, let me tell you. And I, I think you guys are going to be really happy you came today. Uh, straight from New York, actually, the creator of this exhibition, uh, Michael Benson. Thanks. I think I'll start in a slightly different way than I was planning. <laughs> Uh, and I'll just say I'm glad we're all here and not either heading towards Armageddon or, <laughs> or rising into the sky, which maybe is not such a bad plan. It's scheduled for 6 p.m. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, in, in that case, brace yourselves, everybody. Um, by the way, a week ago, Monday, I actually saw six people rising into the sky aboard the uh, next to the last space shuttle launch. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking at the time, and this is really uh, anything I wrote down in advance, that um, I was with my wife and my son, and my, my wife said it's almost like a religious experience. And um, I think what she meant was it was such a powerful thing to see this massive piece of technology rising into the sky. It was like a miracle, you know. And I've been thinking about how, you know, we create. Uh, we create the technologies which provide a sensation of error to ourselves. You know, so rather than a rapture with everybody rising into the sky, I actually saw the actual event, and it is doable. Okay, um, so let's go to the first slide. Um, so I'm not going to talk at first about what I do. I, I want to get into what I do a little bit later, and I want to start by talking a little bit about the history of astronomy. Um, in the beginnings of astronomy, all observations of the heavens were necessarily naked eye observations. Uh, this is an Assyrian star chart, which was found in the library of a king who reigned more than 2,600 years ago in Mesopotamia. And you can see the data representing the Babylonian constellations arrayed out from a central point. Here we can lower the lights a little, is it possible? It's not necessary, but if it's not possible, it doesn't matter. Um, the Babylonian astronomical diaries are a record of systematic observations of the heavens, and they extend from the 8th to the 1st century BCE. So the work of the Mesopotamian astrologer astronomers represents by far the longest continuous scientific record, or the record of the longest continuous scientific research in our history, in human history. Is, it, 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 modern science has existed half as long as that. And we tend to forget that. We look at the Greeks, and of course we should be impressed by what the Greeks accomplished. But the Mesopotamians had century after century of observations and record keeping. So next slide. And of course, as today, there was a necessity to store the findings, the data that had been amassed in as portable uh, a form as possible. So the, the, the astronomer who made that disk wanted to be able, he didn't want to go to a library to consult it, he wanted to be able to take it with him. Or her, but I think it was he, <laughs> safe to say, it, in those days. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the single most stunning, for me, condensed uh, record of Babylonian astronomy. This copy belongs to the British Museum and it's less than five inches high. And when I saw it in Florence, Italy, two summers ago, I was really shocked by how contemporary this miniaturized, condensed, compressed data looked. Um, it's full five inches are packed from top to bottom, as you can see, with cuneiform incisions recording the Babylonian constellations. They're so dense and linear that, to me anyway, they, they resemble a clay model of a silicon chip. So next slide. But I wonder if something like a silicon chip, the one on the left, obviously, has any possibility of surviving with its data intact for anything remotely like the 2,200 years that the clay tablet has survived. Okay, next. 
So with the invention of the telescope in 1609, optically assisted observations of the heavens became possible for the first time. Here you, you can see Galileo Galilei showing the Doge of Venice, the chief executive of Venice, his name was Leonardo Donato, how the instrument worked. Galileo was demonstrating the telescope during the day, and it is oriented towards the horizon and not at the sky, because the utility of the instrument in naval warfare was a, its chief selling point for the chief executive, uh, the ruler of a large maritime empire. I mean, who cares about some, something like discovering what all, the ancients could only dream about if you could actually detect that Ottoman convoy before they had the slightest idea you were there, with gold on board and silk and so forth. Okay, next. So essentially with the telescope, we have the lens, the lens of a camera, but no back and no photographic emulsion, or CCD chip is what we use now. Telescope-assisted observations of the heavens predated the invention of photography by 230 years, and this meant that astro astronomers had to depict what they were seeing with drawings. So artistic talent uh, was, was, was necessary for astronomers for many, many years. This is one of Galileo's drawings of the moon. Okay, next. By about 250 years after Galileo, or the mid-19th century, the telescope had expanded radically in size. This 58-foot-long telescope was built in Northern Ireland, which, which could boast, and con continues to be able to boast, only 60 good viewing nights per year. <laughs> it had a four-ton mirror, and in fact, it had two four-ton mirrors. Why did it have two four-ton mirrors? Because they tarnished so rapidly. In, in that atmosphere, and they were made from early alloys, that one of them had to be continuously polished while the other one was being used. Um, this, was, this telescope was called the Le Leviathan of Parsons Town, and it was built by William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross. It was the largest telescope in the world from 1845 to 1917. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So despite the Irish skies, the telescope was more than big enough to glimpse an intriguing spiral structure in several examples of what were then still thought to be nebulae within the Milky Way. And the Milky Way, in turn, was, was assumed to be the entirety of the visible universe, um, Milky Way galaxy. This is a drawing of what was then called the M51 Nebula, which is now understood to be a massive spiral galaxy more than 23 million light years away. Parsons' drawing created a sensation. This was drawn by Parsons, William Parsons. Parsons' drawing created a sensation when it was widely reproduced, and by 1882, it had made its way into a popular <coughs> French book on astronomy. One copy of which, in turn, was acquired by a certain mental institution in the south of France. Next slide. Uh, so here we have the result. One result of William Parsons' observation. It is now widely accepted by art historians uh, that Parsons' careful drawing of what he assumed to be a nebula uh, made its way via that French textbook into the center of the single most famous artistic depiction of the night sky, which is, of course, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, which is in MoMA in New York. He was, of course, a patient at that in San Jose. It was here, too. Was it here? It was here. Oh, in this very right? building? No, oh. no, no, in San Francisco. Oh, right. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah. 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 Okay, next slide. So again, this was due to the reproduction of a sketch made before the use of photography was practical in astronomy. And next slide. When I showed this series of pictures to a friend of mine um, who has a certain art historical background, he said that the fact that the spiral goes counterclockwise in Van Gogh's painting, let's go back. Uh, no, no, back. Okay. Back one more. Okay, so here you see it's, sorry, it's going, it's okay. Here it's going clockwise, and you go back, and then forward, yeah. That's counterclockwise, okay? So um, when, he, when he saw that, he said, the fact that they're opposite uh, proves that Van Gogh was dyslexic. 
This is apparently one of the one assumption about one assumption about, about Van Gogh is that he was dyslexic. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, no, it proves that he was compensating for the inversion of created by the mirror of the telescope. <laughs> I, think I think it's dangerous to underestimate a great artist. Okay, let's go forward. So just to cap off this series of images, this is a particularly astonishing view of the, of the same galaxy, the Whirlpool Galaxy by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a mosaic of many individual shots, which I used in my last book, which is called Far Out, a Space-Time Chronicle, published in 2009. This Hubble view will be the ultimate visible light portrait of this galaxy for a very long time. Unfortunately, in the book, I didn't flip it. I should have thought of that, but... <laughs> okay, next. So by the 1880s, stars, this is taken later in the 30s, but by the 1880s, stars were routinely being discovered using photographic techniques. And since then, astronomers stopped having to draw what they were seeing. And in fact, virtually all astronomical discoveries uh, were the result of the marriage of the telescope and photography, be it plate-based, that's a plate, photographic plate, or digitally CCD-based CCD as, as all um, astronomical photography is now. Next. So now we're fast forwarding to the early 60s, um, 50 years ago. By the early 60s, a new kind of photographic astronomy became possible. This is a graphic depiction of one of the mid-1960s lunar orbiter spacecraft, which were used by NASA to scout the moon prior to the Apollo landing. Uh, first one was the 69, first landing by, by astronauts. And this, this I used in my 2003 book, Beyond Visions of the Interplanetary Probes, which is what this show is based on. Um, now, with unmanned robotic space probes, for the first time, we could literally send telescopes, telescopic cameras, to the object being observed. Um, five of these spacecraft were sent to the moon to map the moon between 66 and 67. Okay, next. As far as I can determine, this is the first image of the full crescent moon and Earth within the same picture ever recorded. It was taken by Lunar Orbiter 2 on May 19, 1967, the summer of love, or the spring of love, I suppose. I was just down in Haight-Ashbury yesterday. <laughs> um, and it wasn't released to the general public at the time, even though, to my mind, it is one of the most extraordinary images from the early history of, of space flight. Um, it required a lot of digital cleaning up, which is probably the reason they didn't release it. I had to sit there for days cleaning it up because due to the, the process of, well, let me rewind a little. The lunar orbiters, this was before it was possible to even have a TV camera on a, on a robotic spacecraft. So, so they had 70 millimeter film on board and they had a laboratory on board. So we sent spacecraft to orbit the moon in the mid 60s that had a photo lab in each one. It, uh, they developed the film, they scanned it, and they sent the, the data to Earth, and it was reconstituted at, at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California, here. Uh, and, but the result was very beautiful prints, but with all these stripes, kind of Venetian blind stripes. So that's what I had to clean up. Okay, so next. Almost exactly a year after that lunar orbiter shot was taken on April 2nd, 1968, Stanley Kubrick's film masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey, gave the world Earth rise over the moon for the first time. Um, let's go to the next. This is a still of that sequence, which was at the very beginning of the film. With this sequence, Kubrick and his close collaborator, Arthur C. Clarke, who I got to know towards the end of his life, I visited him in Sri Lanka, where he lived for three times I visited him. Um, the two of them correctly intuited and predicted the paradigm-shifting power of the next image. And this is, of course, the first color Earthrise picture taken by the crew of Apollo 8 on December 24th, 1968, the day before Christmas, eight months after the release of 2001. The existential impact of this shot cannot really be overestimated, and it still echoes today. Um, it has been called the single most influential environmental photo ever taken, but I think it's one of the, one of the most influential photos ever taken, period. Um, 
This shot proved that Buckminster Fuller's observation that we are in a spacecraft and it's called Earth is correct. Um, I don't know if you folks have ever heard the story, but uh, towards the end of his life, Buckminster Fuller was being um, interviewed by a young journalist who said, um, Mr. Fuller, do you ever regret not, having, not being able to go into space yourself? And he looked at the journalist, he said, where do you think we are? <laughs> so this, this, picture triggered, this picture triggered an entirely new way of understanding our place in the universe. We had understood since Copernicus, or at least some of us had understood since Copernicus, that we were no longer the center of the universe, uh, that the sun was probably the center, and then later on we realized, no, 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 the sun is in the, in the galaxy, and so on. But, but I, I would say that until this photo literalized that for everybody, we didn't internalize it somehow. But it was undeniable with this shot. Okay. So I'm, this is returning to 2001, A Space Odyssey, and an ob I'm going to return to this and, and, and quote an observation by the president of the Rhode Island School of Design, one of the leading design schools on the East Coast, who said that innovation is born when art meets science. This, this painting is by space illustrator Robert McCall, who died two years ago, and it was used as one of the posters for 2001, A Space Odyssey, which again was released in 68. And next slide. Now look carefully at this for a second. Is there something strangely familiar about that super thin tablet computer with a keyboard on its screen? Uh, uh, again, this is a prediction of what would be in common use by the year 2001, which last time I checked was a decade ago. Next. So clearly, Kubrick's brain trust of futurists invented the iPad well before uh, Apple got around to it, but of course the technology, underlying technology, had to catch up with the idea. Okay, next. In December last year, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and I discovered this grouping of photographs in a show called Between Here and There. And if you look at the shot just to the right of that door, we'll go in closer to that in the next slide. So in this show was an early example of a handmade space photo mosaic, which takes me right up to what I've been doing lately uh, for almost 10 years now, which is del delving into the deep archives of 50 years of interplanetary missions, looking for extraordinary shots, and then compositing them, mosaicing them, and making what you see around you. Um, the individual photos in this particular example were taken on the surface of the moon by the Surveyor series of spacecraft, which were contemporaries of lunar orbiters. Uh, and uh, of course, they had to, the photos had to be assembled by hand because this is way before digital image processing was, was practical. For the same reason why we didn't have iPads on. We just didn't have the processing power. And I would note, by the way, that the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art, is an art museum, it's not a science museum. If, if it had been a science museum, it would have been across the park from itself. <laughs> okay, so I was happy to see this in an art museum. Okay, next shot. So I, I use digital tools to, I, I use digital tools to do a lot of what was done before by hand, but a lot of work still has to be done by hand. Um, this is a screen grab of a Mac computer's finder window of a folder filled with images sent to Earth by the Cassini mission to Saturn, which is still currently orbiting Saturn. And by the way, that shot is by Cassini, and, and so are the ones in the back of the room. Those are Cassini. Those are predominantly Voyager. But actually, those are mixed. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next. So this is a closer view of that rough assembly now flipped sideways so you can see the planet in a more kind of traditional orientation. I, I was using the finder window as a kind of scratch pad to determine if I had enough shots to make a represent, representative final large image mosaic. The arrival of Photoshop digital image processing in the early 90s enabled the assembly of this kind of mosaic um, with seamlessness as well as the compositing of black and white images shot through various filters to get color 
composites. Okay, so that, if, let, if we go back one second. So this is still not finished, it's that complicated. Uh, I, I really have been having problems with it, so I want to show you one that I did finish uh, in, in January. Next shot. Okay, so with, with this shot, the rings are virtually edge on. This, these are the rings of Saturn. We're looking at them almost from the edge. Uh, those are the shadows of the rings. It's northern hemisphere winter, southern hemisphere summer. And these are two of the moons of Jupiter floating there. And I print this quite large. This was a, this is a six camera pointings, which I composited together. It took about probably five days solid of work to get to get it to this stage. Um, by the way, the, the Saturn is now currently crossing into northern hemisphere summer. So for, for a few days or even a week, a few months ago, the, the rings were exactly edge on. There was no shadow at all on the planet. Now they are in the southern, they're now in the yeah, the shadows are now in the southern hemisphere, creeping towards the su southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is, is getting less and less blue and more and more yellow. It's all very interesting. Um, next shot. Okay, um, this is another view of Saturn uh, that I put together fairly recently from six individual raw frames from Cassini. And what we're seeing here is the night side of the planet with none of the illumination that you can see here provided directly by the sun. Everything you see here is indirect lighting. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, now, if the, lights, if the lights were a little bit lower, you would see that this is the dark side. This is not direct sunlight. What's going on here is that, and this is the dark side of the rings, which is not entirely dark, but it's the side that is not directly illuminated. So what's going on is that the sun is hitting the rings, light is filtering through the rings. Wherever the rings are darkest, they are brightest on the other side of the rings because they're reflecting the most light. It's the densest part of the ring. Wherever the, the rings are brightest here, it's where they're thinnest. The rings are made out of ice particles and so forth. And on the dark side of the planet here, uh, on the top right, you see the direct bounced light, I mean, an indirect bounced light. It's sunlight bouncing off the lit side of the rings illuminating the dark side. And everything below here, which is slightly illuminated, is lit by light that's filtered through the rings. So you've got all kinds of layers of, of filtered light there. OK, next. So I'm going to briefly take you through the process by which raw data can be turned into images like the previous one. This is the typical state of a raw frame from one of the two Voyager missions that took a grand tour of the outer planets uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, this is a picture taken of Uranus through a green filter on January 24th, 1968, when Voyager 2 had already been in space for almost a decade and was traveling at four times the speed of a rifle bullet. Um, and you can see various data gaps and all these dots are, I won't get into too much detail there, but they all have to be removed by hand. You can't use a filter because then you, you reduce image quality, the image quality. Um, we go to the next one. This is what year again? Uh, that was 70, 60, uh, 86, January 24, 24th, 86. Thank you. And the computers were a decade, actually more than a decade old. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing. Um, OK, so this is Uranus in true color uh, after the preceding shot had been cleaned up and, and composited with two other pictures. So ideally, you want a red, green, and blue filter uh, taken at the same time, or almost the same time. They can't be taken at the same time. Um, and then you get RGB. You know, all of our digital cameras, they have RGB. You know, you, you, they combine red, green, and blue just the way our eyes does, and you get a color picture. But with, with planetary photography, typically the spacecraft will have many, many filters because these are scientific missions. They're, they're designed to try to look at various wavelengths and so on so that scientists, planetary scientists can try to understand what's going on. If you're lucky, you get a red, green, and blue. Sometimes you just get red and blue, and then you've got to interpolate green. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more detail, but it, it can be quite entertaining. Let me put it that way to put it all together. 
Um, by the way, Uranus is the first uh, planet photographed by any robotic mission that was unknown to the ancients. It was just, it was simply not bright enough in the sky for them to detect it. Uh, Saturn was the next one in, and it's more than bright enough. Okay, next shot. So like Saturn, Uranus also has rings, though they're much thinner and fainter. And at about the same time that the narrow field camera uh, camera of Voyager was taking the shots that I composited for the previous image. Uh, the wide field camera was taking shots, uh, wider views of the planet and its rings, and they were exposed for the rings, because the rings are much darker. So that's why the planet here is, is completely blown out, and you see the rings. This is multiple shots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven individual shots, which I put together uh, to create a kind of a scaffolding <coughs> Uh, if we go to the next shot, I'll tell you what I mean. Um, so I cut out, in the previous shot, I cut out the rings, uh, and I laid them exactly where they should be in the, in the narrow field composite in order to create a scaffolding, which I used to hang, let's go to the next one, next shot. Um, here you can see I'm starting to hang narrow field shots of those rings, the same rings. Now, the narrow field shots are higher resolution. When you, when you composite many of them together, you're approaching the resolution that we can get from a Hasselblad or something like that. Uh, so let's go to the next one where you can see a closer view. So you see, I was, um, what I did was I hung lots of these in the, in the right position, uh, using the wide field shots, which are lower resolution as a guide, and I made uh, about, 35% of the rings, and then I cloned that, and I made the full uh, 360 of the rings. And if you go to the next shot, that's the final result. If we didn't have so much light on the screen, you would see the rings better. Um, I, this is a print that I, I, I make all my prints in northeastern Italy uh, in a lab that uses a Lambda machine, which prints digital files on photo paper, traditional analog photo paper. So all of these are actual photo, they're not inkjet, they're, they're on photo paper. We go to the next. What was the total length of time to take all those photos? You mean for the spacecraft to take the photos? Um, the flyby of Uranus was extremely fast because of the speed I mentioned earlier. They, and it was also um, a real achievement to, to uh, get photos in such low lighting, you know, so for each shot they had to turn the spacecraft a little or turn the camera a little to compensate for the motion of the spacecraft. I think that the total flyby, I mean, those pictures were all taken, all the pictures you've seen were taken within 30 minutes, uh, of, you know, of each other or they wouldn't have worked for what I was doing, you see. Um, it was necessary for them to be within the same time frame for me to get away with presenting that picture there. Uh, as one image, you know, rather than some cobbled together composite. I mean, it is a cobbled together composite. Okay. Um, actually, elsewhere in my work, I have, um, I've taken, uh, for example, um, I found a, a, an extraordinary image of the moon of Jupiter called Io rising over the dark side uh, by Voyager, uh, and only the left part of the image, uh, I think that the picture is here. Uh, only the left part of the image had three filters, so only the left side could be in color, but so Io rising was in black and white, and I was very frustrated by this. And so I, I got in touch with a uh, collaborator of mine, his name is Paul Geisler, he's a leading planetary scientist and remote imaging expert, in, in, he's at Flagstaff, he's with the U.S. Geological Survey. And I sent him the shot and I said, what can we do here? He said, well, let me uh, get back to you, and then he, he figured out exactly which hemisphere of Io, the moon, uh, was, pointed, was pointing towards uh, Voyager's camera. And he found data from ga the Galileo mission 20 years later, and he sent me a composite. So the, the detail was from Voyager, so I wasn't cheating that badly, but the color was from a mission 20 years later. <laughs> so that's, that's really a composite. Um, so next. So this is a view of my show at the Smithsonian, which I just took down uh, three weeks ago, um, it was hanging for a full year. There were 148 prints on view in the equivalent of seven rooms, and that's the Mars wall, or the Mars room. I was very proud of that. It was very cool. And next. And this is the Saturn room, which 
which I was also, you know, I couldn't be quite believe it when I had all those pictures up, but you know, it looks good here too. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get into the last section of my presentation uh, and take you on a kind of a tour of the solar system and what I consider some pretty extraordinary sights. This is an oblique view of Mars made out of four camera pointings, each of which took three photographs with three filters, uh, allowing for a color composite. All of them were taken by the Viking Orbiter 1 spacecraft on July 16, 1978. And you can see this scar cutting through the center of the picture. That is the grandest canyon in the solar system by far. Uh, it is as wide as the continental United States. So the Grand Canyon would be maybe the equivalent of this tiny little, this line. Okay, that's how grand this canyon is. Um, and one of the things I like about this picture is that if you look closely, you'll see ground fog in the canyon. That is the densest part of the atmosphere of Mars because it's the lowest part. And in the morning, you'll have fog. And I, I just love shots like that because they, they, and also you can see atmosphere up above and around. Um, that just confirms that we're talking about a serious planet, that it's, you know, it's not the moon, and so forth. And by the way, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I got to know Bill O'Neill, who was who ran the Galileo mission to Jupiter. Uh, but before that, he, he served on the Viking. He was a navigator for the Vikings. There were two Viking orbiters and two Viking landers. And um, he was at JPO. He's retired now. And I asked him, what was it like when you got the first shots from the surface of Mars? What struck you? Tell me. He said, I was shocked that the sky was bright. And I said, well, what do you mean, why? He said, because I had thought it would be black, like our shots from the surface of the moon. He didn't realize, and probably most people didn't quite grasp, that there was enough atmosphere so that the sky would be bright the way it is on Earth. I mean, it's a different color, but... The initial shots were black and white anyway. So I, I just thought that was such a nice detail. And apparently it was five in the morning when they got them. And you know, I, asked, I asked, did you celebrate? And we were so exhausted, we had a little <laughs> glass of champagne and fell down. <laughs> okay, so next. This is, uh, this is one of the images I'm, I'm most proud of um, because it wouldn't exist if I hadn't found multiple individual frames this is about 90 individual Viking orbiter frames, uh, which I found, and you know, as I was researching uh, my book, which came out in 2003, I spent months and months just going through archives of NASA online, and I found um, I found an individual frame about this big, and I could see that there was something going on, some kind of storm, and then I found neighboring frames, and I started putting it all together, and finally, after you know weeks. Um, I, I came to the limb of the planet and then the other limb and I put the whole thing together. I got very excited because I realized once you get to the limb, you have something that can, you know, you can put forward as a, as, as a cool image somehow. You need to see that horizon. Um, the individual shots that make up this picture were taken by Viking Orbiter 2 on February 19th, 1977. Um, frequently, you know, uh, frequently spacecraft are, are commanded to take photos in rows like this so that later mosaics can be made, as you can see earlier in that uh, metropolitan, uh, the Met picture. But not that frequently are they made because planetary scientists typically don't have time. They're not in it for the, for the visuals so much as for the, the data. Um, so I have the privilege of being able to sometimes assemble uh, scenes that, that really nobody else has seen before, um, which is one reason I'm in it, into it. I mean, for example, that previous shot where you can see the dark side of Saturn, you know, I put that together and I think I finished at two in the morning and I was all alone looking at my big screen and, and I felt, I was just amazed because I felt like I was the first person, first human being ever to see what it would look like in color at high resolution. And that's what's possible with this public domain data, which you know, NASA has a very <coughs> enlightened uh, image release policy. It's all released to the public. We pay for it. It belongs to us. Yeah. And I have a kind of ambiguous, despite it belonging to all of us, I have an ambiguous kind of authorial relationship to this image and, and also that Saturn image because I put, I put them together. <laughs> I created them. I didn't take the individual shots. Okay. So. 
Um, I do feel kind of like, and anybody else could do it, but it wouldn't look quite the same. And anyway, they would be copying what I did. I mean, they, they would be copying, they would be finding, we're talking hundreds of thousands of individual frames. When you have, and in fact, millions of individual frames if you talk about the whole history of robotic spaceflight. So I would argue that, that when you go in there and you find, you know, 90, which you can put together, um, you know, in a sense, you're taking photos in the archive. You know what I mean? Anyway, not to put too fine a point on it. By the way, Mars is the only planet in the solar system that has global weather patterns. You can have an entire global dust storm on Mars, and the entire planet turns into this featureless brown ball. This is an early stage of that. Okay, next. So do you own those images? Uh, not only do I own them, but I have a gallery in New York, and I sell them in limited edition. It's, uh, by the way, it's, uh, what I do is covered under US copyright law by the um, uh, by, it, it, is, it is called derivative work. So people who create der derivative works from pre-existing image are, are protected. Okay, so this is obviously the Earth, the Mediterranean, and you can see sand from the Sahara blowing into the Mediterranean. I don't know if you can see it that well with the lighting, but there's sand blowing up from Libya towards Sardinia and Corsica. This was taken in August 2000. Next shot. And here also you can see sand blowing into the southern Atlantic. That's from Namibia, um, the Kalahari Desert. Um, the desert coastline of Namibia is so dry and dangerous that they call it the Skeleton Coast. There is no water. Uh, many, many ships have, have wrecked there and, and people died of uh, dehydration on that coast. Okay, next. Okay, and here's a truly amazing view of a dust storm on Mars. It's picking up momentum, uh, taken in 77, February 77 by Viking Orbiter 2. There's also no liquid water here, although there may be under the surface, but not on the surface. Okay, next. This is a view of the largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, with two of its inner moons. Io on the lower left and Europa on the upper right. This is Jupiter's famous fire and ice pairing of moons. Io, which is the one that was rising, in, when I, which I, I found data uh, from a mission 20 years later, is the most volcanic object in the solar system. It's got at least 400 volcanoes constantly erupting. And Europa on the upper right is essentially a huge drop of salt water uh, with a thin ice crust. It's the largest ocean ever discovered. It may have four times as much water as all the oceans of the Earth in that one world. And it's also the leading candidate as a potential home for extraterrestrial life. It probably had liquid water for billions of years. We simply don't know. Okay, next shot. So that's a closer view of Io. That's a true color view of Io. Um, Again, the most volcanic object ever seen. If you look closely, you can see two volcanic eruptions, one on the upper left and one on the upper right. Um, there are at least 400 volcanoes, as I said, going full blast all the time, and that's what we know from relatively simple instrument packages that whiz by at high rates of speed. It's probably many, many more. Um, as a result, Io has one of the youngest surfaces of any world in the solar system. Not one crater on Io that we have detected is from an asteroid impact. They're all from volcanic activity. It's constantly resurfacing itself. It's, it basically has a grape skin of, you know, soft material on the surface, and everything underneath is liquid magma. What, what's the size of those two moons relative to the Earth? So they're both slightly under the Earth's moon. Yeah. And actually, Jupiter's two larger moons, Ganymede and Callisto, are bigger than Mercury. So they're planet size. And in fact, one reason why Io, in fact, the reason why Io is constantly erupting is that there are large sister moons orbiting outside of its orbit. Uh, Jupiter is, the, is a, by far the most massive planet. If, if it only had one moon, then that moon would not be active necessarily geologically because it, it simply would have frozen into a kind of stasis relative to Jupiter in orbit. But because Io has three large companion moons orbiting outside, um, every time they pass by, there's a gravitational flexing in Io. They're constantly yanking Io 
and massaging Io until it becomes volcanic. That's what's going on, essentially. Okay, next. And this is Sicily's uh, Mount Etna volcano erupting in October 2002 with the smoke blowing all the way down towards Africa. Um, and so you can see where I'm going with this. Part of the fun for me of the Beyond Project is to see these, all these linkages between our own world and uh, other worlds in the solar system. And basically what we've been doing for 50 years when it comes to astronomy and planetary science is uncovering a vast continuity of related landscapes all orbiting the central sun. The same sun, different landscapes. So the Earth belongs to a, a much greater continuity, and we know that with lots of uh, images by now. So 50 years ago, we, we, we simply didn't have any such image or images. Okay, I'm going to end with the next two. So, obviously we orbit the Sun, but the Sun in turn is orbiting something else, which is the core of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, this is a map from my last book, which is called Far Out A Space Time Chronicle. And it tries to situate the solar system in a far larger territory. Um, that's the solar system. These are all objects, that's Orion, Pleiades, uh, various other nebulae which are, which, are, which are seen in the book. Um, but I wanted to show this just to give a sense of the far wider stage that everything previous is in. Um, let's go to the next one. And finally, this is a reprocessed version of the latest most cutting edge map of what we believe the Milky Way looks like. Now we haven't been able to send a spacecraft to look at the Milky Way from any kind of distance. In fact, our most distant uh, object is one of the two Voyager spacecraft that took some of the pictures I've shown you before, and it's barely at the edge of the solar system. So this is simply, this is, um, uh, this is guesswork, but based on data from uh, the Hubble and other space telescopes, including the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and you can see the solar system, uh, we, we used to think that the solar system belonged to a major arm. I mean, first we were the center of the universe, then the sun was the center, and then, okay, if, if, the, if, if the sun couldn't be the center, at least we were in a major arm. But quite recently it became clear, no, 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 no. This is a spur. The Orion arm has become a spur. So we exist in a spur. Sorry to tell you. Um, so that's where we're sitting right now, in Petaluma, in California, <laughs> on Earth, in the solar system, in the Orion spur, halfway between the center and the outer edge of the Milky Way galaxy. Thank you. Luckily, the Earth seems to not be ending today. Oh. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, uh, piece piece. Tell me a little bit about your background and what prompted you to do what you're doing now. Well, I'm not a scientist at all. I, am a, I was an English major and a photography minor in college. Then I went on to become a journalist. I worked at the New York Times for a couple of years as a news assistant, not as a full-time journalist. And then I left. Uh, I quit to become a freelance journalist. I wrote about uh, Russian rock and roll for Rolling Stone magazine uh, in, in the 80s. You know, then I went to film school, uh, NYU film school, and I went off to Slovenia, ex Yugoslavia, to make a film about uh, a crazy art movement there. It's completely unrelated to space. But um, I traced this kind of work back to, uh, well, I've had a fascination with space forever. I mean, since I was a, a small child. You too, I see. Um, my mom took me to see 2001 A Space Odyssey when I was six years old. Um, and I'm, I, I will always remember following her down Broadway uh, in 68, saying, what did it mean? What did it mean? <laughs> and, and she said, I don't know. I'm not sure. And then I saw it many, many more times. And as I said, I got to know Arthur Clarke, who was very much a co-author, in, in a way, of that film. And um, I always, and of course, at the same time, we were landing on the moon. Uh, so I think there are a lot of people like me who grew up at that time who, who remain very interested. 
Um, and then later, when I was living in Slovenia trying, trying to make this film, and even after I had finished the film, I was still living in Slovenia, which is, you know, right next to Italy and Austria and so on. Um, you know, I start, when the internet came around and everybody could get on it in the mid-90s, um, I logged on, and after I got over my excitement, uh, the excitement that I could read the New York Times, uh, you know, ahead of New Yorkers, because we were six hours ahead, um, I started looking at images from the Galileo mission to Jupiter because I was fascinated by Europa and planetary science. And then I wrote uh, an article, because I'm also, well, I'm a writer and a photographer and filmmaker. Um, I wrote a piece about how kind of extraordinary it is that, that an, you know, a private person, a non-specialist, could basically get, in, get involved in, in self-directed space exploration from Central Europe using the net. So I wrote a piece about that, and that led to a book contract. And then um, throughout that whole period, I, I knew that I wanted to do exhibitions. You know, I knew that 50 years of, of planetary photography constitute a significant chapter in the history of photography as photography, uh, rather than being some nerdy thing that space freaks do, or, or being associated only with science, you know. Um, and so that's, in a way, the argument I've been making with this work and with my book, um, that this belongs to photography <coughs> and the landscape. And you are showing your work, okay, you read the Smithsonian. Yeah. And then, of course, you have a gallery in New York, and then where are you going from? Is this all of your work in here? No, no, no. I didn't I, I, think so. I had 148 prints at the Smithsonian. And then where will you go from here? Will you go to a bigger venue? Well, I'm looking for uh, a next um, venue for the big show, the Smithsonian show I just took down. In fact, um, you know, the Exploratorium and I were in talks, but they're moving to a new location. And actually, I was just there today, and I hadn't seen it before. And, and I'm not sure where I would put a show like that there, because it's mostly these fantastic machines. Um, but in any case, um, you know, I'm trying various other uh, options. But I have, as it is, I have this show, which is touring. Um, I have a show which is up at the Dulles, Museum, uh, Dulles uh, Airport, uh, uh, public art space at Dulles right now. It's been up for six months. Um, I have a show in Europe. Actually, I have too many framed pieces at this stage. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you publishing to iPad yet? Are you in that? Good question. Program? Not yet. No, no. I, Are I, you I, planning that? I, you know, yesterday was the deadline. No. Friday was the deadline to send um, uh, an application to NASA for a grant for a grant for education and public outreach. And as part of my grant application, I'm asking for funding to work on a touch screen ready Can't thing. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Because so I'd like to be able to. I would like for people to be able to open a picture and then open it and yeah. move around it. Yeah. 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 We, we need to talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> you have a catalog of uh, your images from the gallery online. Orders, prints. Uh, no. You have to go to my gallery, which is Hasted Krautler. Um, but online, I mean, I have a website online, and it says it, it gives contact information. My company's called Kineticon Pictures. I can, I can give it to you. Yeah. yeah. Some of these images are just so striking. It would be wonderful to be able to see a catalog of. Mm -hmm. Prince to buy. Yeah, well, uh, actually, my book, Beyond, um, in some ways, can be used that way. Right. Although there are lots of newer images. And in fact, uh, one of the things I'm working on this year is a new book called Planetfall. Uh, so that would be 20, that will be 21st century planetary images. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm um, I would imagine it only makes sense in close up photography, but is NASA doing any 3D photography? Oh, yeah. yeah. And in fact, James Cameron is collaborating with the uh, team that will be la launching uh, a Mars rover the size of a VW Bug uh, this fall or this winter to Mars. And it has two cameras on, on a mast, uh, you know, and uh, for stereo. And actually, the existing rovers also have done a lot of 3D work. Uh, but 
and I just heard uh, the latest information about all that is that on camera and the, the guy running the mission were pushing hard to have uh, essentially telephoto lenses on those two and, and it got shot down at the last minute so so it's not going to be his intention is to make a 3d film of, of Mars and I'm sure that they'll bring that off but it won't be as perhaps as good as it could be because they don't they don't have the telephoto lens but it, I think it'll still be quite interesting Yes. And actually, you can do 3D images um, even without having two cameras mounted next to each other. You can do it by, you know, if you have a series of shots from one position and then the spacecraft moves on and it takes more shots here, then you could make, you can make 3D images. It's quite complicated. I hesitate to get into that myself. It's really complicated enough. But um, it's doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'm not a photographer, and this is going to sound dumb, but back when the, these spaceships are shooting, uh, like in the 70s and 80s, and they're going so fast, and the solar system is going so fast, is the data that you're looking at from, I mean, is it sharp? Yeah. Or, or do you have to do a lot of compensate? You don't have to compensate a lot? Well, look, the solar system is going fast, but the, you know, I mean, the, the, Spacecraft is only going fast in relation to the object. Right. You know, let's ignore the fact that the solar system is whizzing around the yeah, center yeah. of the Milky Way because we're all kind of moving along in, in one direction. Right. Right. Um, but you know, even though the spacecraft is moving fast, uh, it's typically not that close to the object. You know, it's not like driving by um, Haight Ashbury at high speed and getting blurry shots or something. It's um, you know, you can usually if the lighting is strong enough. Um, which it typically would be inside the orbit of Uranus, let's say. The lighting is usually strong enough so that you can have a fast exposure. You know. But it good. depends, you know. I mean, so for example, um, uh, Cassini took a bunch of photos uh, from the dark side of Saturn, and they're really and they had to be very long exposures because of the low light. And so they had to do all kinds of wizardry to compensate for what would otherwise be, I mean, to, to avoid blurry. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are several of us here who are uh, from the local observatory. All right. And we have a, a, a very vibrant outreach program yeah. for the public. And I'm, I'm fascinated on your, your, your comment there about the uh, interactive, because I, I see the look at the faces, especially the young people who oh, yeah. can get interactive. And my question to you is, do you see anything coming out from your shop in terms of things that we can use as docents to plant that seed for science? Or even I think you were planted in the audience to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> because actually the answer is yes. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, I hope to. Um, the, the, the main thrust of my application to NASA sent in Friday uh, was to an ambitious national education program uh, involving leveraging what I'm doing in, in my books, you know, and of course new NASA material and uh, uh, the writing I've done and other material uh, for, for K through 12. And um, my whole idea is to involve kids. I've seen kids in my show at, at the Smithsonian. I mean, I was really moved. Uh, you know, typically, you know, I mean, like a lot of people, uh, you know, I sit in front of my screen, I do my work, and then I <laughs> have dinner and I go to bed, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't get a sense of an audience or anything like that, and, and, but I had a show up for a year at the single most popular museum in the world when it comes to attendance. There were eight million people who visited the museum in the last year, and because um, it's free and it's there in the mall, and it's, you know, of course, it's a great museum. Um, and so I got to sort of be a fly on the wall in my own show. And the kids, I had sort of, uh, I had predicted to myself that kids would be turned off by the lack of interactivity, you know? Um, but in fact, kids were swarming all over that show, and they were really interested. And of course, there were fingerprints all over all, all the <laughs> pictures, because they wanted, you know, they, they sort of assumed it would all come to life. But, but even, even though it, they didn't, I was constantly emailing them saying, can you clean, do you mind cleaning the pictures again? <laughs> but, um, but even though they, you know, it's not as if, I mean, I watched this, and they didn't turn around and make a beeline out of there when the picture didn't move. They, they were, you know, really kind of interested. So, so the idea is to use the, this material and, and make a, um, 
such a seductive experience for kids that they get involved in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, so that we have, you know, people to, to, con to continue this, this incredible story. And I'll just finish that, that line by saying that um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Scott Bolton and his team were in New York. Scott is running the Juno mission to Jupiter, which is launching August 5th. Uh, there will be a mission to Jupiter launching this year. It's going to go into a polar orbit. And, and so I, I joined them for dinner, the entire team, in this restaurant in Midtown Manhattan. And there were three big tables filled with people. And it was mostly gray-haired, gray-bearded, actually, also, <laughs> people. And there weren't that many younger, younger faces there. And, and that's, mm. that's what planetary science and science in general is facing these days. Yeah. Uh, are you, have you been to JPL recently? Not recently. Okay. I was there for Cassini's arrival. Are, uh, you, are you familiar with the person who uh, actually works at JPL who's contracted to NASA for their community outreach? Um, yeah, what is her name? Sherry? Second name? Asplin? Uh, I know the name, but I, I met some other people who were in Washington for a meeting on an outreach. Okay. Um, I know that name, but uh, there's some other names I can't. She's, she manages that for NASA. Oh, okay. And Public outreach around JPL, you mean? <clears throat> or in general? No, for, for NASA. It's a, it's a kid's program. Oh, okay. And she's a good friend of mine. Oh, good. Well, I would love to, uh, maybe I can get her contact information from you and yeah, talk her along. Yeah, we need to talk. I'm a retired yeah. JPL. Are you? Yes, I am. Okay. And so is my husband. Oh, great. Well, you retired to an incredibly perfect place. <laughs> I envy all Glad of you. you that. No, I noticed it. I lived right next to Italy for many years, and, and the, your, your uh, landscape here reminds me of Italy, but without the downsides. Yeah. yeah. As far as I can tell, without the downsides. <laughs> yeah. In both the, the drawing and that NASA photograph of that, galaxy that was thought to be a nebula? Is that the Crab Nebula? No, Whirlpool, M51. Crab Nebula is an actual nebula, by the way. Okay. Yeah. There was a splotch at about 2 o'clock. Was that a small a, a cluster being gobbled up by the galaxy? That, well, that's a neighboring galaxy. Um, it's, it, those are interacting galaxies. Um, we could even go back. Well, it's, it's many it slides back. But, but, um, it's a neighboring galaxy. One reason why the Whirlpool is, is considered such a classic spiral galaxy and is so is exploding with star birth, one theory is that its interactions with the neighboring galaxy um, have purified the form and, and are compressing the gases to create all this explosive star birth. So you caught something there. It's a, it's a very good question. I mean, there are many, many galaxies interacting in the universe. Yeah, I'm not sure like what percentage. Hmm? Looks like it was being pulled in. Yes, yes. There's a, there's a tendril of one of the arms is reaching to the other. If you if you get a hold of my book far out, you'll see close-ups of the gas and dust coming off of M51 and, and going into the neighboring galaxy. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's like an umbilical cord of of, of material. No, no, it's back. Is it? One of the first ones. Okay. The first Because the Crab Nebula was in on the last frames too, but maybe that's. Not oh, it's back. One. It's back. Yeah. So this is all. They're linked. It's not an, an illusion, and, and a lot of uh, material is falling in. And, and in fact, um, one reason why the galaxy is elongated is because it's being stretched by gravity. Mm -hmm. I.e. question, uh, but it's pretty obvious how you would transmit uh, data for digital images to reproduce photographs from a camera in space. Before we had digital cameras, how did they do that? Um, well, they scanned and they sent a radio signal, a radio signal, and it was an analog wave. You know, um, rather than being zeros and ones, mm -hmm. you know, and, and here I'm really reaching the limits of my uh, expertise. I have to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, have, I didn't get that far into it. Like light, various gradations of the, of the amount of light versus dark? Or yeah. 
Yes. Like a something <laughs> white, white and black and ten. And no, no, it was not digital. It was pre-digital. Pre so it was, you know, it was an analog method of sending. You know, I mean, we had TV signals at that time. True. You know, yeah. um, but I can't, I can't uh, express it with any kind of authority. So I won't try. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks very much for coming. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to see these two paired off because um, clearly um, it's left to the individual venue as to what will hang with what. And, um, you know, again, you know, as I said in my talk, um, one of the joys for me of the project. Um, beyond project was seeing these comparisons here. You can see again volcan volcanic activity on two in two different worlds. One is ours, and, and one is orbiting Jupiter. Here you've got uh, obviously ice flows and so forth, and and, and atmospheric activity on Earth uh, in the north uh, near Greenland, um, and in fact that is Greenland on the left. And here you've got the Hellas impact basin on Mars, which is um, uh, it's lower than the rest of, of the surface of Mars because of some impact, massive impact. And you've got carbon dioxide frost there, and also clearly a, kind of a cloud coming off of that carbon dioxide. So that's, I, lo I love that comparison. With these pictures here, uh, I mean, who can tell me uh, who can tell me what they think is going on there? Does anybody here have any idea what's going on? Moon going in front of you say a, a moon? It's actually our moon going in front of the sun. And the reason that our moon is not exactly matching the size of the sun, which is the way we see it from Earth, when, when there's an eclipse, is because the Stereo B spacecraft was further away from the moon than the Earth is. Uh, and so I love that picture because, uh, and also, you know, what I would really like to see is the Earth. Can you imagine the Earth passing in front of the sun? That has not been captured yet. And that's, that's upcoming, probably. Um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the mass of the solar system is in this raging ball of energy. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. It, it almost gets forgotten a lot because it's the light lighting everything. You know, you don't typically think about the film lights that are lighting the set. You think about what's happening on the set. But... That's most of the solar system right there. And we wouldn't be here, obviously, without the energy from that thing. So this is another, this is another impact basin. Um, it's right on the limb of the moon uh, as we see the moon from Earth. And so it wasn't really discovered until very late in the day um, and in fact, but the discovery, it's, this, there's an interesting story connected to this. Um, this is a lunar orbiter picture from 67, and I de-striped it. Um, and this is an amazing thing. The, the highest mountains of the moon are here. You can see these peaks are lit, even though the rest of the moon is in darkness, because they're so high, they were pushed up due to this impact of a major, major asteroid on the moon. <laughs> well, this was discovered by an interesting technique which I read about a few years ago. Um, somebody had the idea of projecting the best images of uh, the moon taken from Earth on a globe uh, and then walking around the globe. Okay, so they projected the pictures of the moon on a globe and they walked around the globe and they saw this. They saw rings. And it was not something that could be seen just by, easily by looking at the photos. It, it took projecting the photos. And so this was discovered on Earth on a big globe. Well, it's kind of unusual story. Um, so I love this shot. It's, um, it was not particularly well known. Uh, and I don't know how much better known it is now. but. Um, um, there aren't that many images taken from orbiting from spacecraft orbiting planets where you see the horizon. It's fairly rare because 
these missions are run by scientists who want the camera pointing straight down, and so you have endless numbers of shots of the planetary surface taken straight down. Mm -hmm. And for any landscape photographer or filmmaker, you know, you kind of want to see a horizon, you want to see some mm -hmm. sense of perspective. So this, is, uh, this was from the orbit of the moon, but it was towards the horizon, and you can see these mountain ranges, obviously. And I also like the fact that uh, um, the shadows are rather dark. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like it would be on Earth with the atmosphere lighting everything and mm -hmm. providing backlight. I mean, you know, I'm sure that if you, if you marched into one of those shadows in your spacesuit, you would see light reflecting. But basically, for the, mm -hmm. for the purposes of photography like this, you, this might as well be as, as dark as space. Um, radar images of Venus uh, really const constitute some of the, for me, the most interesting results of this project. Um, Venus has a, this is Venus on the left. It's very hard to, it's impossible to take photos of the surface of Venus unless you physically land there and then you can see uh, for a short distance around the spacecraft. The Soviets did that. The first landings on another planet were on Venus by the Venera spacecraft. Um, but the pictures were taken straight down and you could see pebbles and the kind of a yellow, in a yellowish light. Um, the atmosphere of Venus is so incredibly dense that it's impossible to get images using visible light from orbit. So um, in the 90s, we sent a spacecraft <coughs> called Magellan there, and it used radar. It went into a polar orbit. It's, it essentially just orbited, and then the planet turned underneath it. And over the course of a year, it painted Venus with radar nonstop, electromagnetic radiation bouncing back, and it got extraordinary images of the surface of, of, uh, of Venus. And I love them because they're so um, visually interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and even, um, they remind me, uh, they're very abstract, and they remind me to an extent of Asian scroll paintings of landscapes. Those are rivulets of liquid? These are, it's all volcanic activity, except for this is an impact crater. So, uh, most of the surface of Venus is, is defined by, by either, either magma trying to push through this, the crust and then you've got all this cracking and a kind of a bulge or actually having erupted. Um, so the, these are lava flows. With, with radar images, the, the, the brighter the area, the rougher the terrain and the darker the area, the smoother the terrain. So that's how to read that. Um, here in this picture, this is a relatively recent picture of the Earth, Messenger, August 2005. It's not that recent. But you can see here, okay, the clouds are very white, but you see the blue smoke? That is what we're doing as a species to the jungle. Um, so. You know, in other, in other pictures, you know, the, the early, the Mercury missions, you know, of the 60s and, and the Apollo, uh, and also Gemini and then Apollo in, in the late 60s, early 70s, you didn't see photos like this. This wasn't happening. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to see that. It's, it's also ominous to see that we're, we're burning up our, our, our jungles. Um, can anybody tell me uh, what that is on the left without reading the label? <laughs> Mercury. Yeah, okay, it looks like the moon, but it's Mercury. We have a spacecraft called Messenger that just arrived at Mercury uh, four or five months ago, and it's orbiting. Uh, but this photo was taken in 74 by the only other spacecraft that ever went to Mercury called Mariner 10. Um, Mercury is... Uh, the, the densest and the hottest, no, sorry, it's the densest planet. Venus is hotter because Venus has this greenhouse effect, but Mercury is not exactly uh, a cool, I mean, actually, Mercury is, is cold. As soon as you're in the shadows, you're freezing, but this part of Mercury is, is very, very hot because it's so close to the sun. It's the closest uh, planet to the sun. Okay. <laughs> Two Mars and Jupiter. <laughs> okay, with, with these pictures here, um, you know, it's interesting. With these pictures here, you have two examples of a very rare phenomenon. Um, 
photos of planets in which you can see the spacecraft that are taking the photos. Um, on the bottom right, all the way over there, uh, there are three pictures taken by a European mission that is currently still chasing a comet. It's called Rosetta. And as part of this chase of a comet around the sun, it flew past Mars back in 2006, 2007. 2007. Um, and on the far right, you, you have this Buck Rogers uh, type image where you can actually see this, the spacecraft and Mars behind it. That's extremely rare. It's the first time uh, that there's ever been such a photo to my knowledge, and that's because uh, the, the, the spacecraft has a little lander that's, that's going to land on the comet, and that lander has a camera, and that camera has an angle in which you can see the parent spacecraft. So they got this picture during the flyby of Mars, where you can see the solar power panels of the uh, spacecraft. Now here, on, on the top and bottom picture here, you've got the results of uh, the Mars rover, the two Mars rovers, they're actually both by the same rover, Spirit. Um, and uh, essentially with those rovers, it's the first time we've had landscape photographers on the surface of another world that can move around. Uh, and um, they're, they're incredible machines. And one of them is still fully operational, and I think it's seven years later? Or is it eight years later? They landed. I don't, have all, I don't have my fix on the exact dates, but it's way past their sell-by date, essentially. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, here you can see uh, a small tornado. It's called a dust devil. They call them dust devils. Uh, and in fact, those guys were, are one reason, one reason the, the rovers lasted so long is that periodically dust settles on the solar power panels here. And then the power level goes down and down and down to the point where a couple times they thought we would lose, lose the rover. And then one of the dust devils showed up, blew right over the surface, and cleaned the panels, and, and they had years of life left. So it's pretty amazing. Um, another detail I would say about this is that um, the original mosaic, this is, um, this, is, this, was, this is based on a mosaic originally released by NASA. The mosaic was pre-assembled. Um, and what I did to it is, um, because the camera is so close to the rover, uh, in the original you see fragments of the rover. They're you know, like puzzle pieces. And so I sat there for a day and I assembled the puzzle pieces and I made a coherent <coughs> rover. Because I felt like if, if these rovers are going to take several portraits of themselves, the least we can do is, you know, <laughs> assemble them and make them look good, you know. <laughs> yeah. And also another, another thing I would say is that um, the dust devil was going at a you know, fairly high rate of speed. So in the NASA release, you see a purple tornado, you see a green tornado, and you see a blue tornado or something like that. Because it was whizzing and, and you know, there were multiple shots taken. So I combined them and I got one dust devil the way we would see it if we were there. Um, this is an example of uh, so-called Aeolian forms. I mean, they're sand dunes, but Aeolius was the god of the winds. Uh, for the Greeks, uh, or was it the Romans, or both. Um, and a lot of the surface of Mars is sand dunes and forms that are created by the wind blowing dust. And I love this, the abstraction that you can get from orbit. All of, all of my choices, all of my image choices are based on aesthetic considerations rather than scientific considerations. And so I look for stuff that, images that could really stand a chance of being accepted as, you know, as worthwhile photos, you know, within the tradition of photography and the landscape. Okay, here you see um, two major volcanoes on Mars. Uh, and this is one end of that canyon system, uh, which I, I spoke about in, the, in, the, in my talk. Um, this is called Noctis Labyrinthus which from Latin, literally translated from Latin, means night labyrinth. And you can see it's a labyrinth. Very complex. I think that the, uh, you know, the Grand Canyon would be about this big, you know, a small part of this. So it's huge. I mean, Mars would be a fantastic tourist destination. We just have to get the infrastructure and then we'll, people will pay as long as we can get it, you know, cheap enough. I, I would go. And here's another example. Uh, why it would be such a tourist destination. This is a sunset on Mars, and that's true color. So the reason you have an inversion of 
sunsets on Earth is that the, the skies of Mars have a, typically have a fine powder floating there, and it's from all the dust storms. So they're kind of salmon colored, the skies of, of Mars. And it's only near the sun as it sets that you get, that the power of the sun punches through all that dust and you get a blue sky for the very same reason we have a blue sky on Earth. Uh, it's called Raleigh scattering. There's a, I, I can't get into all the details, but essentially one wavelength is given preeminence and that's blue due to the scattering of light in the atmosphere. What is it about Mars that enables a global weather pattern that you mentioned? Well, there's so much of this uh, fine um, um, oxidized dust on the surface. And so, um, you know, when you do have wind, it gets picked up. But I'm not, uh, I am not a scientist. I can't, I can't go much further than that in explaining why it's global rather than, than local. But, you know, it's interesting. One of the Mariner missions, um, the first mission or the second mission ever to go into orbit of Mars, when it went into orbit, there was a major, major dust storm. And so basically all the pictures were of blank nothingness for, for, for weeks. And then finally, they started to see something emerging from all the dust. And one object looked like an island with a kind of crater in it. And it was the summit of the largest volcano in the solar system, which is called uh, uh, Olympus Mons. And that's how they discovered the, the volcano because the dust was settling and then like Ararat, you know, coming out of the flood, you know, uh, there, was, there was something rather than nothing there. <coughs> this is that picture that I was talking about where that's Io rising and the cult, the detail is from the, these are Voyager shots from February 79. Uh, but this did not, I didn't have color data for the right side. So Paul Geisler of US Geological Survey found color data, which I put underneath um, to get a color, full color shot. And another, uh, another little story connected to this is, you know, I was going through thousands of images for the project. And, um, you know, um, as part of those thousands, there were innumerable pictures of Jupiter, or the atmosphere of Jupiter, and I was just going through each one methodically and kind of dutifully and conscientiously looking at all these shots. And um, if you imagine the right side of this, black and white, low contrast, um, that's one frame from Voyager. And I went, you know, I saw a black and white version of this with something going on in the darkness, and I wasn't sure what it was, and it, you know, it didn't strike me as being very important. I thought it was a mistake or something, and I went past it. And about half an hour later, I think it was like two in the morning, and I was kind of tired. I thought, wait a second, what was that? That that was not some. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a mistake. It had to be something else. So I went back and I found it, and then I experienced one of these um, these moments where the hair was rising on my arms because I realized it was a moon rising over the dark side of Jupiter. And again, I felt like I was the first one to see it. <laughs> you know? Even though I, I'm sure I wasn't. I'm sure that you know, at JPL or whatever at that time, they said, oh, that's Io rising. Let's go to the next one, because we're looking for atmospheric data or something. Or, or maybe somebody thought, this is pretty cool. But you know, I, I felt like I was one of the first people to see it. And I, I'm sure I'm the first to see it in color in the end. So, so and now you can see it. This is my favorite single image from all of the Beyond work I did. Um, that is Europa, which is a giant drop of water orbiting Jupiter. It's the leading candidate as potential home for extraterrestrial life in the solar system because it has almost certainly had a vast liquid water ocean for, for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, probably billions. Um, and to my mind, I think that NASA, I think there should be a major program to investigate uh, Europa. And in fact, I had lunch with the head of uh, the Planetary Science Division of the Science Mission Director at Jim Green the other day. And not to get into too many details, but yet again, a major flagship mission to Europa has been canceled due to budgetary reasons. There were at least four of them in the last. 15 years, it's a major tantalizing enigmatic object, Europa. Um, does it have life? If it doesn't have life, what, what happened? If it had a liquid water ocean for millions of years and there's no life, why is that? 
Uh, I personally think, and a lot of people think, there's got to be life there, but we simply don't know. Anyway, he told me, Jim, that they're exploring lower cost, cost alternatives for a mission to, to Europa. Uh, and I, I just personally love this image because it's, you know, it's a, an extraordinary sight. Um, it wouldn't look like that if you, were, if you were nearing Europa in space. You wouldn't see a solid wall of cloud behind Europa like that. That's because of extreme telephoto uh, lenses, telescopes. So you could, you could actually get a similar kind of shot of the moon in front of the United States if you were far enough away with a strong enough lens, you know, with a large enough telescope. You would have that foreshortening. But I just love the effect anyway, even if it wouldn't look exactly like that. Yeah. So here is the most volcanic uh, object. Um, you can't see those eruptions here, you know, which I showed in, in that slide because I went back into the data later. Um, the software used to make this sphere look like this did not allow for, it didn't examine anything above the limb of the planet, of the, of the moon. And so um, I decided to go back into the raw data and look for signs of eruptions, and I found two. So that's why in the later version of this, you can actually see eruptions on the, on the limb. And that's another shot of Europa. Uh, Europa is essentially like a vast ball of string in a way. You've got endless cracks on, this, on the surface. And that is because of gravitational flexing due to the right. canyons, right? Well, no, they're not canyons. It's very smooth. This is the single smoothest uh, object in the solar system that we know of because it's, it, there's no, uh, there, there are no continents sticking out of the ice. It's just water with ice on the surface. So they're cracks. I mean, if, if we could land, there would be ridges. There would be a rough terrain, but it wouldn't be anything like the canyons on Mars or anything right, like that. Right, right. And the cracks are, I mean, the cracks are really a riddle. And um, a group at in Tucson has been uh, scrutinizing the mystery of those cracks and has really come up with some, some interesting explanations for what made the cracks and, and, and it provided crucial evidence leading to the conclusion that there's liquid water underneath. Should we go to the next room? Okay. <laughs> So Saturn, this is the dark side of the rings, again. Um, the sun is below the rings as seen from Cassini when it took the pictures that made up this mosaic. Um, but I really love this shot because there's something about it that gives you a sense of depth. Um, I think there's another shot of Saturn which is maybe not hanging. Oh. Uh, did we walk past it? Uh, okay, well, so in that shot, you see the lit side of the ring. So both sides are represented here. Um, the rings are made of millions and millions and millions of pieces of, of mostly ice, but there's also some kind of rock in there. And they're thought to be uh, the result of the breaking up of a moon a long time ago. Um, and they're... they're, they're their width to thickness ratio is about the same as a piece of paper. That's how thin they are. Uh, this is Uranus. In fact, this, is, uh, this was taken the same day as that mosaic um, that I showed you when I was giving the talk, you know, where you can see the rings. This, is, uh, this, was, this was created earlier than the one which has the rings in it. Um, and then these two shots, why don't I just end with these two. Um, so this is Neptune on the right uh, with its moon Triton. And that's Triton. Now when, when Voyager 2 reached uh, Neptune in August 89, um, you know, none of the outer planets had been, been seen up close before. And um, it was kind of assumed that you know, that, 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 first of all, that the moon would just be a cratered, um, not very interesting cratered satellite. But Triton turned out to be one of the most interesting things that Voyager photographed 
uh, you can see that the surface is actually not unlike uh, Io, the volcanic moon. It's a very young surface, and, and when, when, when Voyager got closer, it, it noticed geysers uh, coming out, you know, coming from cracks in the surface of Triton. So clearly there was, rather than being a, being a completely geologically dead object, there was activity going on. So here you can see these black streaks. That's all from geysers of some kind of carbon coming out. So the sur and the surface also indicates there are no craters from asteroids. Uh, so it's a very young surface. So it's not clear exactly what's going on there, but the orbit of Triton around uh, Neptune seems to indicate that it might have been a captured Kuiper belt object. And that's, uh, that means it probably came from the outer part of the solar system, way beyond the orbit of, of Neptune. Uh, and came in somehow was captured, and it's possible that the, the act of capturing it created a lot of friction generated um, uh, heat, which is causing some, some form of uh, geological activity. So, and I happen to love this picture. Um, this is on the cover of the hardback version of Beyond, uh, because this is the last, essentially, I mean, there, were more, there were more pictures taken after it, but only for the next couple of days. And to me, this is the last shot of Voyager as it headed into the unknown beyond the solar system. So it's kind of a parting look at the last planet um, as Voyager headed out and then was, was asked to turn its camera systems off. So for me, it's kind of moving. You know? And that's how I want it. Thank you.